Hi, and welcome to today's episode of Piano TV. We're gonna be taking a look at my, yeah, it's gonna be like my personal opinion, my favorite list music. And I've chosen six pieces here that aren't necessarily gonna be like the most famous music by list, but they're the pieces that I think represent best the breadth of his style. So there's a lot of different types of pieces we're gonna be look at, looking at. We're gonna look at a symphonic poem, we're gonna look at some of his original works, we're gonna look at some of his transcriptions. And before we get into all of that, I wanna take a minute to discuss Liszt's performing style so we can get a sense of like what kind of a performer he was, what kind of a musician he was, how he, what his style was like, and then we'll start talking about individual pieces. So let me know in the comments which list pieces or songs are your favorites, and let's get started. So here's what we know about what Liszt sounded like on the piano. Carl Cherney said he played according to his feelings, and concert reviews said that his playing demonstrated brilliance, strength, and precision. There was also a comment about how well he could keep absolute tempo, possibly because his dad made him practice a lot with the metronome as a kid. And we also know that he often did a lot of improvisation in his concerts. We also have a specific description of Liszt's playing from the 1830s from one of his students' parents, um, Valerie Boissier's mother kept a diary of these piano lessons, and I think this quote is a really good summary of what Liszt probably would have sounded like. Liszt's playing contains abandonment, a liberated feeling, but even when it becomes impetuous and energetic in his fortissimo, it is still without harshness and dryness. He draws from the piano tones that are purer, mellower, and stronger than anyone has been able to do. His touch has an indescribable charm. He's the enemy of affected, stilted, contorted expressions. Most of all, he wants truth in musical sentiment, and so he makes a psychological study of his emotions to convey them as they are. Thus, a strong expression is often followed by a sense of fatigue and dejection, a kind of coldness, because this is the way nature works. And aside from all that, apparently Liszt also had the quirky tendency to make big dramatic gestures and facial expressions when he was playing the piano too. Liszt is mainly known for his piano compositions, but he didn't write for piano exclusively. He did write some orchestral and vocal pieces as well, although he's mainly known for his piano music. And he's also known for that piano music being extremely difficult. Liszt also transcribed a lot of music. So what that means is he took music from other people, usually instrumental music, um, and made it just for piano in his own arrangement. Probably about half of like the entirety of Liszt's compositions, some 800 compositions, about half of those were transcriptions. Liszt is also credited with the invention of a genre called the symphonic poem, so we're definitely going to be talking about that today. We'll mainly be focusing on Liszt's piano music today though, just because that's what he's most uh, well known for. His transcriptions, sorry, his original piano music, because his transcriptions, though abundant, um, aren't necessarily as well known or considered as important in standard repertoire. Among his famous piano collections, include the famous Years of Pilgrimage, and we're actually going to look at two pieces from these three collections, um, because they, they're they collections that have pieces of all different kinds of moods, and they're just really, really diverse, really neat collections. But he also has um, Hungarian dances, he has valses, consolations, etudes, and lots of other different types of original compositions. He also wrote piano transcriptions of his own music. So a really famous example of this is his Liebestrom, uh, originally written for vocals. But the version that we're most familiar with today is the piano only version. We actually did a whole video on the Liebestrom if you wanna check that out. We're not gonna mention Liebestrom in the top six today just because I feel like we've already talked about them quite a bit on this channel. The first piece I want to look at is from his second Years of Pilgrimage collection. It's called After a Reading of Dante, or just sometimes nicknamed the Dante Sonata. This is a one movement piano sonata composed in 1849, first published in 1856. It's an example of program music, and we'll talk about that in a second, but it was basically inspired by Dante's epic poem, The Divine Comedy. Program music is when a piece of music also comes with notes for the listener. It, it's sort of how lyrics and music give you an idea of what a song is all about. Program music had programs to tell you the themes and stories to listen for in the instrumental music. In this piece, we hear a lot of the devil in music, the diminished fifth tritone, to really cement that hellish imagery. There's a second part of this piece in a major key, which contrasts all the hell themes with joyous heavenly themes. But the clip I'm going to be sharing with you is from, probably predictably, the hell part of the sonata, because I just think it's really cool.
The next piano piece from Years of Pilgrimage that I want to share with you is entirely different in character. It's from the third set, and it shows Liszt's evolution toward new musical styles. This piece, the Fountains of the Villa d'Est, was composed in 1877 during Liszt's later years in life. Um, it sounds really impressionistic, and it foreshadows guys like Debussy and Ravel. He definitely paved the way for them. You can clearly hear Liszt heralding in a new generation of music in this piece, so let's have a quick listen to that. The final original piano piece we'll take a look at today is his highly famous and highly difficult Sonata in B minor. This was first published in 1854 and it was dedicated to Robert Schumann, another famous romantic composer, uh, and this is mainly because Schumann dedicated one of his fantasies to Liszt, so it's kind of just returning the favor. As such, the Schumann family received a copy of the piece, but Clara Schumann, who was Robert's piano playing wife, didn't really care for it. I believe she called it merely a blind noise. She wasn't the only one to dislike the sonata. Apparently Brahms fell asleep when he was listening to, per to a performance of it, and music critics had more than their share of scathing comments about it. I think the main problem with it was it was a little bit ahead of its time. It was uh, too weird and too dissonant to unpleasant sounding for um, the people at the time. But it did have its supporters because, you know, some people are forward thinking musicians. So Wagner was a huge fan of the Sonata, for example. And it's a really, it's considered a staple in today's repertoire nowadays. That was like the missing element. It just needed time. And now that lots of time has passed, we can appreciate the sonata. So this sonata is about 30 minutes long with no breaks, which makes it different than a standard sonata. Most sonatas have a few different movements and it's like a pause between each movement, but this is just kind of like a relentless 30 minutes. So even though we're gonna just be listening to a small clip, as always, as always, as always, I encourage you to listen to the full version, but let's take a listen. As previously mentioned, Liszt composed about 800 pieces, half of which were transcriptions. So one thing about music, especially orchestral music in the 1800s, is that it wasn't accessible to everyone. So part of what Liszt was doing when he tr transcribed these, these works into piano was to make them accessible to like more people. He would take Schubert symphonies and do a piano arrangement, Beethoven symphonies, make a piano arrangement, and then that gave more people, it gave those those uh, pieces wider exposure. Liszt was also really creative with his transcription, so we have to give him credit for that. He didn't just copy like everything and you know translate it to piano as like a direct copy. He added his own spin to it, his own individuality to them. Despite that, these transcriptions disappeared from the music world in the 1900s because the the atmosphere changed and people started considering transcriptions not real music and they just kind of ignored it, figured it was like lesser music than if it was truly original. Because of that, most of Liszt's transcriptions are just kind of lost to history, but there are still a few collections that you can get a hold of, you can listen to. The one I want to take a look at today is his paraphrase on Verdi's Rigoletto. Uh, and we'll talk about that, but it's not necessarily one of his most famous transcriptions, but I think it's a really cool, really creative arrangement of a really beautiful piece. Verdi was a famous Italian opera composer in the Romantic era. We actually talked about him in the opera video series we did a while back here. Um, Liszt created an excellent concert piece from a particularly dramatic moment in the opera Rigoletto, 
and uh, he made his own spin on the music, but he maintained the really melodic quality of Verdi's writing. It's really emotive, really expressive, and it basically shows off all that a piano can do. It's a great example of Liszt's fun and breathtaking virtuosic style. As we talked about at the beginning of this video, Liszt also did transcriptions of his own orchestral music for piano, the most famous being his Liebestrom. Um, but again, since we've already talked about the Liebestrom on this channel in fair, like a fair amount of depth, I'm not gonna get into that in today's video. Instead, I wanna look at his first Mephisto waltz. Liszt wrote four Mephisto waltzes, and the first two were originally written for symphony, but he transcribed them for piano, and he did both like solo piano versions and duet versions. So we're gonna be taking a listen to the solo piano version of the first Mephisto waltz, which was composed somewhere between 1859 and 62. It's a really cool piece. It's highly syncopated, almost jazzy. And this is another example of program music, which we've already talked about here. So I just want to show you the note that accompanies the score. There's a wedding feast in progress in the village inn with music, dancing, carousing. Mephistopheles and Faust pass by and Mephistopheles induces Faust to enter and take part in the festivities. He snatches the fiddle from the hands of a lethargic fiddler, draws it from its indescribably seductive and intoxicating strains. The amorous Faust whirls about with a full-blooded village beauty in a wild dance. They waltz in mad abandon out of the room into the open, away into the woods. The sound of the fiddle grows softer and softer, and the nightingale warbles his love-laden song. Let's have a listen. Liszt was responsible for developing a brand new musical genre in his time called the symphonic poem. So I think it's important that we spend a couple moments talking about this. Symphonic poems are written for orchestra and they are designed to evoke some type of art, whether it be literature, a play, uh, like a piece of art, anything like that. Um, it's usually directly influenced by a specific story or piece of art. Franz Liszt was the first person to attribute the name symphonic poem to his works and he wrote a dozen of them. So this genre is less about um, traditional structure and format, kind of like, you know, sonatas which have a really strict format. It's more about just evoking a mood, an image, a scene. The symphonic poem we'll be listening to is Orpheus, written in 1853 to 1854. He also wrote a few other symphonic poems about legendary men like Tasso and Prometheus, uh, but this is the one we're going to listen to. I think it's cool. As with all of these choices, that's kind of how I made my decision. This is uh, written for small orchestra, and it has the notable inclusion of two harps, which represent Orpheus's lyre. Apparently Liszt was inspired by a touring virtuosic harpist named Jean Paul, and so decided to write some harp for, you know, just for fun. Orpheus is a lovely piece. It's basically one giant crescendo. I mean, you won't really hear that in the 30 seconds here, but if you listen to the full version, you'll see. The mood is serene at first and then later becomes very triumphant. Um, and it's very contemplative. This is this was one of Wagner's favorites. I don't know if that sells it for you or not, but let's have a listen.
And that is all for today's video. I hope you enjoyed the short tour of some list pieces that I, I think span his repertoire uh, fairly well. Of course, there are dozens and dozens of other pieces that are really good and worth listening to. Like, definitely check out the Constellations and the Etudes. But my favorite collections by list continue to be the Years of Pilgrimage. All three of them are excellent and are just incredibly diverse, really neat music. So give this video a like if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you haven't already. And thank you all for watching this video. I really appreciate it. I'll catch you in the next one. List wasn't, sorry, but um, let me say that again.